That October afternoon, my sister Nina and I seemed to have the whole forest reserve to ourselves. We saw nobody working, but people had worked there, erecting buildings, mowing weeds, clearing brush, planting evergreens, setting up informational signs. The state has no lack of laborers. The reserve had a well-kept, competent appearance, a look of leisure and invitation that has inspired many people to come there to relax and enjoy the occasional return to the land which is essential to humankind more so than ever in this privileged and pressed against generation. In the orchardist time there was always more work than he could get done, even with the help of his children and the hired men. At one time or another, most of the men living around there worked for the orchardist. They walked to the farm, arriving by six o'clock in the morning, hung their dinner buckets and coats on pegs in the lower barn. They quit at six in the evening and walked home, and the going rate consider considered adequate for this day was a dollar. They could keep their families on that. They had very little taxes to pay. They had a house and most of their food from their small farms and the woods surrounding them. Occasionally, they had the use of the orchardist driving horses. One of my father's favorite stories was about the time one of the young hired men of courting age came early one fine Sunday morning and asked to borrow... the best driving mare and buggy. He was dressed up, obviously intending to make a celebration of the kind he had a reputation for. Knowing Fred would not be trustworthy with a lively mare that day, my father made the excuse that he needed the, the rig himself. The exasperated hired man cried, Now, Frank, you know you can't use that buggy and hit a rainin like hit air. In addition to the hired men that came by day, the orchardist usually had one or two of Aunt Rosie's big boys living with us. They were like brothers to us. One was bossy and domineering, the other loving and helpful. In those days, farmers and hired men alike were always thin. They, were, they wore suspenders instead of belts. Their clothes were baggy at the knees and elbows. Their shirts always had long sleeves. The widow's young son always wore work gloves. I never saw a fat farmer until I lived on a livestock farm in a different country, different county, after Dick and I were married. Most of the hired men could chew tobacco, and one generously gave my sister Nina a good big chew one day when she was in the field where he was driving a team of horses to the roller. She chewed it and did not get sick, which may have been a disappointment to him. To him. Indubitably, the hired men suffered to some extent at the hands of the orchardist's children. In his rather extensive travels, my father was always meeting men he considered interesting. If they owned land, he encouraged them to plant orchards, trees to be supplied by him, of course. Otherwise, he invited them to come and visit us or work for him. Many came, many came often. The editor of a poultry magazine came often from Illinois. The manufacturer of a famous tonic came and discussed the decline in his sales that resulted when he was required to change its formula. A real estate man came from Ohio, the state Entomologist came often and took photographs. A young Assyrian immigrant came bringing the English book he was studying in order to apply for U.S. citizenship. My sister Miriam undertook to teach him English, and as soon as he learned enough English words, he proposed to her. Bill Pofall came to work and lived with us. He was a German, obviously had delusions of grandeur, but was harmless. 
His German military training was evident in the way he walked, sat, and saluted. He entertained us with splendid stories of his warm friendship with the Kaiser. He played German ballads on a good harmonica, which was about all he had of worldly possessions. Thriftily, he wove long ropes out of short lengths of rope and pieces of binder twine. His favorite workhorse was the blind Sorrel Queen. At the barn, he greeted her personally to the gusty appreciation of the other hired men with a cheerful eight o'clock queen and talked to her all the time as he guided her along at work. Once driving queen to the slip scraper to take away earth thrown out from where a cistern was being dug. He let her get too close to the edge and she fell into the excavation, getting her out somewhat skinned up but not crippled, required everybody including the BB cousins visiting us that summer. If we wanted time for playing on work days, we had to sneak away without attracting the orchardist notice. One of his favorite admonitions learned from his Quaker mother was Satan finds work for idle hands to do. He reminded us that she had often said to him, Thy time, thy precious time. He himself believed there is no excellence without great labor. Without ever telling us in so many words, he made us realize we were expected to carry in wood and water to the kitchen. When he wanted something done well, he encouraged us by telling us, You can do it to a queen's taste. Unwittingly, he probably fostered everybody's writing proclivities by a bit of wry advice he gave us when we complained. If there's something that doesn't suit you, just write it down and burn it up. There were so many things that didn't suit us that we had abundant practice in writing. There is no doubt that the orchardist loved his children deeply, but he was stern, often autocratic. At the table, he told us what his mother had told him. Eat what is set before you, asking no questions. It was years, however, before I knew this was quoted from the Bible. No one was permitted to interrupt his conversation at the table, regardless of whether it was interesting. Often he began a long, detailed story, then stopped to eat a while before resuming the story, but we had to wait until he finished it. He made absolute rules, and we broke them absolutely, but we did so at our own risk and tried not to get caught. One place we were strictly forbidden to invade was his office, so of course we were drawn into it at irresistibly, as irresistibly as a moth to the chimney of a coal oil lamp. It was a downstairs room blessed with its own outside door in addition to the door leading into the small front hall at the foot of the stairway. There was a big dining table there and always overloaded with stacks of papers, the Indianapolis News, the Chicago Packer, Horticultural and Poultry and Farm Magazines nursery catalogs, seed catalogs, almanacs, calendars, and agricultural yearbooks. They slid off the table in an ever-flowing glacier. More were stacked inside the ten-door safe, in which also were the breathtaking nursery salesman's books we coveted. These had hard covers, long and narrow pages, slick paper pages printed in marvelous colors, and showing fruits and flowers of such opulence as one sees only in dreams, and then only if the dreams have been well cultivated, pruned, sprayed, nourished, winter mulched, and hand thinned. His typewriter table was a small kitchen table, and above it was a kitchen cabinet topped with pigeonholes and doors and drawers begging to be explored. Every child in the family yearned to possess that room for his own, and every one
of us stole in from time to time to try a couple of fingers on that old Monarch typewriter. I learned to type in those golden stolen moments. I never learned to type accurately, but I learned to type fast because if the orchardist found one of us there, it would be a painful encounter. He sometimes sent us out to break off the peach switches with which we were to be punished. We could delay the moment then, but only temporarily. His worst punishment resulted probably from his Quaker upbringing. In a family of seven lively children, the embattled clashes can be noisy. Ours often were. The orchardist was always able to hear them, no matter how far away he seemed when the quarrel started. He heard us by the time it got satisfactorily underway. Invariably, he stopped his work, called us to him, and gave us a long, boresome sermon on love. Then he required the fighters to kiss each other and dismiss them. We gritted our teeth and kissed, but as soon as we were out of his sight, the fight was resumed, even more bitterly, but this time quietly. His Quaker upbringing was responsible also for silence instead of spoken grace at meals. The silence was not always reverent among his children because he did not instruct us in its meaning or bring us up as Quakers, which I for one sincerely regret. Years later, when I discovered the philosophy of the inner light, it spoke co cogently to my condition. It may be that people inherit a tendency toward philosophical beliefs as truly as a tendency to write or to have brown hair and blue eyes or to be left-handed. My mother's family were devout Methodists, and before she moved to the country, she had been active in church work, had taught a Sunday school class, kept the cradle roll records, and played the organ. She must have missed this spiritual comfort when she came to the remote orchard farm, bringing three little girls and a somewhat frail little boy, and in the later years when three more little girls were born there. Living in the country was new to her to begin with and hard. She had grown up in a small Ohio town and always got homesick when she went out to her grandmother's farm to spend the night. To her the evening song of the whip for will from dawn from down near the big spring, a beautiful sound to the rest of us was a lonely cry. As a young girl, she had always wanted to write, so perhaps it was some comfort to her that all her children grew up liking to read and that most of them became writers. During her third pregnancy, she wrote a book of alphabet verses for the baby. She always wrote letters, even in later years, when her eyes had failed so badly that she could not read what she had written. When we were little, she drew pictures for us on sheets of school tablets. They were always the same. There was a house with smoke pouring out of its chimney, a wild rose, a ripe strawberry, a man pumping water from a long-handled pump, a woman holding a bucket, a cat, a dog. When the older sisters had boyfriends in the living rooms, we had three living rooms by that time, the young men brought polite boxes of chocolates, and mother took the younger children to the kitchen and made fudge or popcorn for us. She was an excellent cook, and my father often remarked proudly how she always had dinner, a noon meal, right on time. She simmered meat or boiled beans, potatoes, cornmeal mush, or wild greens in the black iron kettle on the wood-burning range. When she wanted to hurry it up, she lifted out the round stove lid and set the kettle down into the blaze. She seldom baked pies or biscuits, but she made gingerbread, cornbread, and baked beans you could write poems about. Twice a week, she baked eight loaves of crusty brown light bread in long black pans. She made apple butter, peach butter, quince honey, strawberry preserves, pear preserves, plum butter, plum preserves, and spiced peaches, using the little brilliantly red Indian clings. She made mixed pickle and copley plaza relish. 
She baked apples in winter. Somebody took a pan and went out to the Apple Hill where Jonathan's and Ben Davies were buried, frost-proof under straw and earth. You scraped back the burlap curtain, earth and straw, and lifted back the board that closed the opening. The wonderful Apple Hill smell came out as you reached back into the cool, straw-lined mound for the cold apples and filled the pan. All winter, apples taken out of the Apple Hill were cold, sound, unwrinkled, and juicy, and had a distinctive Apple Hill flavor. The orchardist always put good apples into the hill, and enough so that there were always some left late into the spring. By Thanksgiving, too, the kefir pears were ripe that had been properly picked when they were still hard and had brown splotches like lichens on the green skins before they developed woodiness. They were stored away until they turned yellow and then they were juicy sweet and sought after. It is only the people who don't understand the proper care of kefir pears who underestimate them. When she first came to the farm, Mother learned about the prevailing Hacker Creek religious order and went to one of their meetings. They were called Crabites, believed in handling snakes, and in times of extreme devoutness, sometimes went into the unknown tongues. In summer, when the narrow roads were good, we went to little churches some miles away. It was a great pleasure to my parents when one day a young man stopped with Bible story books to sell and said he was going to represent the American Sunday School Union in the community and would organize Sunday schools in various places. The Reverend Mr. W.C. Chaffin became that day a good friend of the Orchardist family and always remained one. He finally inspired the Hacker Creek people into building Little Valley Chapel, a few miles from the Orchard Farm. In his years of itinerant service, the minister has traveled many thousands of miles. Worn out, several horses and buggies and cars performed hundreds of marriages, including finally that of Harve and the widow, Haiti Bales, more hundreds of baptisms and preached words of comfort at many funerals. He grew older, plumper, balder, and always more loved in the community. He said, I wouldn't have time to be president if I were elected. This work is more important. He said, smiling, please tell me their troubles and I listen. People tell me their troubles. It gives them some comfort and it doesn't hurt me to listen. The Orchardist children never attended any of the Crabite meetings, but my sister Nina and I once heard one of the believers go into unknown tongues. Quite unexpectedly, it happened late in the strawberry season. Miss Atkins' granddaughter, Flossie, about the age of Nina, had come to pick late strawberries for her grandmother. She was alone up in the long strawberry patch on the open ridge above the locust grove. It was mid-morning of a clear, bright day, thinking to make a little diversion for Flossie and being also eager to make the most of any unexpected opportunity for companionship. Nina and I painted our faces and bare feet with the juice of early elderberries, swathed ourselves in sheets which considerably hampered our walking and walked the long distance from our house up to the strawberry patch. Like the father of the prodigal son, Flossie saw us while we were yet afar off. She stopped picking berries, straightened up, and watched our stilted approach. Then, to our complete amazement, she suddenly screamed, I know you, Nina, but who's that with you? And then she dropped the bucket and ran for the, from the patch. As she ran, she went into the tongues, a high-voiced, incoherent wail of unrecognizable syllables. It took us some time to catch up with her and bring her back and help her retrieve the scattered strawberries. One of the last landowners to give up his land to the State Forest Reserve 
was Charlie Talbot. His farm was not far from High Gap. When he bought it from the Hubbards, who were friendly young people and sometimes visited the school or came to help when there was illness and Miss Hubbard felt she could help. It was badly eroded and run down. Charlie had come from a city a great distance away, and the first time we saw him was one morning soon as he moved to the farm. He came to the kitchen door angrily asking for the orchardist against whom he already had some complaint. If he wants trouble, I'm Johnny on the spot, he told mother. I'm not afraid of man or devil. No doubt the city had treated him harshly all his life. He was a man of violent temper to begin with, and having been mistreated, always expected to be, and was prepared to return it. One of his hired men told about Charlie throwing a pitchfork at his mule. The prongs went into the mule's flank, and Charlie let the mule run with the fork dangling out of its side. He built up his road into a good road and threatened to shoot people who used it without his permission. People were afraid of him and for the most part let him alone. He settled down to improve his farm. He planted raspberries and strawberries and for an interim crop while they grew into bearing he raised tomatoes which he hauled nine miles into town on a wagon. A woman had moved to the farm with him and after a few years he took her to town and married her. They both worked as hard as he expected his mules to work, and the farm began to build up profitably. Later that fall, he came back to our house, bringing Mona, to pay a neighborly social visit. My parents were trying to put up a stove in the dining room. You just let old man Talbot do that, he said jovially. I'm Johnny on the spot when it comes to putting up stovepipes. He cut his hand on a jagged piece of stovepipe, and it bled, but he said, takes more than that to stop old man Talbot. At that time, he was not really an old man, probably about 40. One early summer day, my mother sent my sister Nina and me to his house to buy some tomatoes. He got them for us, but would not accept any money. Mona was just taking fresh baked bread out of the oven. She cut slices of it, spread them with apple butter, and we all sat down and talked. Charlie, affable and expansive, was being Johnny on the spot as a good host. When we were about to leave, he went upstairs and brought down a doll's headless body and gave it to me. It was the biggest doll body we had ever seen and undoubtedly the most expensive. Even its fingers were jointed. It had belonged, Charlie said, to his daughter, but that was all he told us about her. In later years, when they had made some money, Charlie and Mona built themselves a new house. Literally, they did the work themselves. It was an ugly house by the time Mona died. Charlie had a tidy amount of savings in the bank, and although people questioned some of his methods of accumulating it, nobody put the questions to him. When the bank failed, the banker was suspected of embezzling and escaped trial by going to a southern state and staying there. Many people lost money in the bank. Charlie lost all his savings. He stayed on in his ugly house, and revenge became the sustaining motive of his life. Just let him come back to Indiana once, he told my mother about the banker. Just once, I'll be Johnny on the spot, and I don't care what happens after that. As Nina and I drove through the forest reserve that October afternoon, we passed a raw, muddy place where timber had been cut and the earth torn up. It was designated as Mason Ridge, but it was not in that place that the Orchardist family had had any of its happy adventures. Or even spent much time. We had hardships, illness, pain, bitter discomforts, and heartbreak sometimes, but the farm never seemed bleak or flavorless. The land was healing, beautiful, full of adventure, beckoning. The life there must sometimes, though, have been a heartache to the woman who had the responsibility of feeding 
doctoring, inspiring, and disciplining a family of nine plus the resident hired men, and all without any of the conveniences modern farm women simply take for granted. My mother was not of a gay temperament by nature. She was deeply conscientious, hopeful, loyal. Her children considered her all but omnipotent. When we were ill, we began to feel better the minute mother came into the room. In a time of our despair, she always reminded us that the darkest hour is always just before the dawn. She was seldom ill, but when she was ill, or on the rare times when we saw her cry, the end of the world came right then. There was one summer she had to walk for several weeks with the help of a kitchen chair. She had driven the spirited driving mare, Axie, to town. Axie ran away, upset the buggy, broke the shafts, and mother suffered a broken ankle. My brother James, a little boy then, had watched a long time for her to come home, and it was he who hunted up the orchardist, finally and said, Papa, Axie came home, but Mama and the buggy did, didn't come. She had named James for her father, whom she had loved and idealized as much as the orchardist had loved and idolized his mother. There was a bond of mutual protectiveness between James and mother. It was probably a secret pleasure to her that a visitor once prophesied to her, James will climb up Jacob's ladder, don't you grieve after him. It was no pleasure to him, however, because his sisters remembered it and repeated it and even sang it to him in songs for years afterwards. But he had his revenge because from time to time other people said other things about the rest of us. I, for example, would gladly have wrung the neck of the well-meaning friend who endowed me with the title Flower of the Family. Anything like this was sure to be used against you forever after the Fifth Amendment offered no refuge. The nicest compliment came from Ben Douglas who was for many years Indiana's state entomologist and was a fine photographer. He spent a good deal of time with us visiting and photographing and in intellectual discussion with my father and once told, later told an editor, friend of his, we were nice kids but simply running wild when I knew them. Mother had her own places of refuge and recreation. Sometimes she drove to town for a day's outing, and occasionally in summer took one of us with her. She took us with her to pick wild blackberries and gather hickory nuts, strawberries, sometimes on Sunday afternoons in late summer. She walked over the farm to find a wild flower she particularly liked. It was a rose genetian, a shallow-rooted, not very tall plant that springs up in sunny open fields, erratically growing where it wishes and no place else, and asking very little in the way of soil fertility. It will not bear transplanting. You come upon it with almost shocking unexpectedness. The five pale pink clear petals of its flower are joined at the base and make a five-pointed star, outlined in white. A small, delicate flower, it has a small, delicate fragrance and a look of simple, sudden loveliness that exhilarates the human spirit. I think that perhaps Mother felt a sort of kinship with it because it gave so much and never tried to be a martyr. The state planted its evergreens with the intention, I think, of selling some for Christmas trees. There were already some evergreens suitable for Christmas trees growing there. We always cut one from the farm. Buying a Christmas tree was unheard of. It has always amazed me how, in a family of seven, restless, inquiring, mystery-probing children, Mother managed to keep the Christmas tree ornaments hidden all the rest of the year. We saw them only at Christmas. We decorated the farm-cut tree with strings of popcorn, gold and silver tinsel, and colored paper chains. Then, from her secret place, Mother brought out the wonderful Christmas balls imported from Germany. They were frosty white. They glittered.
From their concave sides glowed the mysterious, beautiful world of Christmas, deep-hearted, transient, forever beckoning, forever mysterious. In those days, Christmas came like a locomotive. You could hear it for weeks off, whistling, rushing, growing, louder, and more unbearably exciting all the time as it came nearer. It shook the earth when it finally arrived and stopped beside you. Its smell was unlike any other. While Christmas paused beside you, you could feel its warmth and the heat of its powerful heart. It was a tremendous, panting, fire-driven event. And when it had gone, you could still hear its whistle dying away far off in the distance. Nothing could hurry Christmas, but neither could anything hold it back. We hung up our stockings in the dining room on Christmas Eve and went to bed. Santa Claus came during the night and filled the stockings. Nobody saw him, but we knew what he looked like because his picture had been on several of the colored, embossed postcards that had arrived, naked of envelope and borne by a penny stamp, in our mailbox during the week before Christmas. As with all greeting cards, there was a schedule by which each of us, in turn, received a card to put into his individual postcard album with the slated pages. You might hear Santa Claus if you listened, but it was doubtful. It was a long, cold way from downstairs, where the stockings hung, to the bedroom upstairs, where you lay. Under at least three cotton-lined, pieced comforts, grateful for the added, added coziness of the newspaper-wrapped hot iron at your feet. <clears throat> we made most of our presents for each other and wrapped them in red, green, or white tissue paper and tied the packages with gold or silver cord and a small economical bow knot. It was an exceptional event if one child bought a gift for another. One Christmas, my brother James gave our sister Grace a small gold-colored silk-lined jewel case he had selected himself. When she opened it, he stood up and cried proudly, and it cost ten cents. Our parents bought some gifts for us, and Mother made many more. In each stocking there were, in addition to small gifts, a few English walnuts, some candy, and on top of all, the luxury that appeared only at Christmas, the orange. For years the smell of oranges, to me, belonged exclusively to Christmas. Mother got up first on Christmas morning and cooked breakfast. When she opened the hall door and called upstairs, Merry Christmas, it was the signal we had been waiting for. We surged downstairs to meet the filled stockings, and they were ours. As the family got older and bigger, Christmas grew also until, finally, our last big family Christmas were wonderful mountains of gifts, glitter, laughter, music, affection, good smells of food, and women's perfume cold air coming in as people came in and out, and baked bean feast late at night after all the gifts were wrapped and placed by the time there were in-laws and grandchildren. We came into the living room on Christmas morning where the tree and piano were. My sister Grace and later Joey played the carols we always sang before Mother distributed the gifts the beautiful, sad, rejoicing Christmas carols, the timeless, immortal Christmas carols. The singing always began with my father's favorite, O Come All Ye Faithful, which my mother called the march. She said, Grace, play the march. Always, that is, except the year my brother was going to be married the day after Christmas. That year, to tease him, the Christmas march was replaced with the wedding march. He laughed, blushed, and took it in good spirit. No matter how many or marvelous the gifts, the best part of Christmas were the jokes by which we expressed our affection and honored each other. Why you couldn't even find the town road to walk to the mailbox now, let alone ride a horse over it, exclaimed my sister Nina as the October, October afternoon pushed closer toward sunset. The mouth of the old road that used to go past the lower barn was by then completely closed in a screen of new trees and bushes. 
it was a two mile trip from the orchardist house to the mailbox but we had to get the mail every day because we got so many letters and newspapers that a small box would not hold two days mail when my brother James went he usually rode one of the horses he liked horses he rode them worked them in the fields fed and petted them curried and harnessed them at school he drew pictures of them on his school tablets and lesson papers he never cared as much for trees and fruits as the orchardist did although he learned to bud trees and worked in the fields with the hired men no doubt the orchard business seemed to him like a hard uncertain way of making a living and like farming it certainly is unless it is your choice <clears throat> when my brother discovered his real talent it was in pharmacy he went to pharmacy college where he was a brilliant student passed the state examination with the highest grade in the state and the whole family including his wife lewis went proudly to his commencement one reason my sister Nina and I liked to walk to the mailbox was that we could stop at the first house at the bottom of the last steep hill in Happy Hollow and ask Katie to go with us. She was about the age of my brother and went to the Hubbard School. The Bales house was a little two-room, one far back from the road, barely out of the way of a creek there which in spring fullness swelled up like an angry setting hen. The inside of the house was always as clean as the inside of a milkweed pod, but Miss Bales nevertheless apologized because it was not cleaner. She was little, shy, quick darting as a mole. She had been a widow several years, her son Spencer, a tall, yellow-haired young man with nice manners, worked for the orchardist and every morning when he came to work his clothes were immaculate he went overseas with the army in the first world war and when he came back he seemed much older and different miss bale's kitchen was small and had a linoleum on the floor a late acquired luxury given her by her son who was a good son and kind to her as she constantly told visitors she was so proud of the linoleum that she scrubbed it every day once in a while during the school year, to my delight, I was permitted to go home with Katie and stay all night. We came down an almost perpendicular hill back of the house. We all slept in the second larger room, and Miss Bales kept a coal oil lamp burning there all night. The walls were papered with newspapers, including some pages of colored comics, and it was pleasant to lie in bed and read the activities of the cats and jammer kids by the mellow glow of the coal oil lamp when katie went with us to the mailbox it was easier to get past the cross dog at the next house where her uncle jake lived his yellow collie was named sheriff and always came out and barked fiercely except when katie was alone and we believed he meant that what he barked jake had been a soldier in the civil war but never talked to anybody about his war experiences. His wife was shy, like his sister, Miss Bales, but she also was kind, and once when Nina fell into a creek, she took us into her, <clears throat> into her fire and let us get warm and partly dry Nina's coat. The only time I remember Jake ever coming to our house was when his work, Mayor, had strayed away and he was hunting her. His question, have you saw Airy Nag, sounded to us like a foreign language and so delighted us that we repeated it to each other for days afterward. When we got as far as the road that turned off to go to Aunt Lou Atkins' house, we were not far from the mailbox. At this point, the road was on level ground and the better open field be fields began to show. Aunt Lou was not really everybody's aunt, but everybody called her aunt. Her house was not visible from the road. It was a pretty house, two-storied, neat, well-kept, an Indiana version of 
colonial. It had the traditional evergreens in the front yard. The beds were made up with beautifully pieced quilts. Aunt Lou churned in a keg churn she kept on the clean swept back porch in summer. She was a kindly small woman with gray hair and gentle hands and a knowledge of nursing. She came when a family had more illness than it could handle by itself, or when there was a new baby. She came when our youngest sister Kathleen was born and declared that was the prettiest baby she had ever seen. She would have been interested to know that the pretty baby she bathed and dressed for the first time was going to grow up to become a script writer for the Voice of America in Munich. Munich. Aunt Lou was the symbol of neighborly kindness, of comfort, the day our best loved dog, Robert, died. My sister Miriam was too deeply grieved to stay for his funeral. She went down and spent the day with Aunt Lou. I took my childhood treasures out of a blue painted wooden box and gave it for a casket for Robert. Spencer, the young hired man, helped us. We put Robert into the box and loaded it into the buggy. Spencer drove my sister Nina and I rode with him. My brother stood up behind the seat and we went to Hill Acres where Spencer dug the grave and we wept as we buried Robert. All Of all our many childhood pets, Robert was the best loved. From Aunt Lou's turnoff to the mailbox, there was only one more creek to cross. The water ran steadily and clean over the pebbled bed that crossed the road. When we came home from town, we often unreined the horses there and let them drink. You could stand at the edge of the creek, watching the clear, shallow water rippling past, and suddenly you felt that you were sliding along and the water was standing still. Sometimes Katie and I took time to fish in the deeper water beyond the road. Our mailbox was two miles from the farm because the mail route ended there, right on the borderline between two counties. The mail came out from the county seat of an adjoining county. We paid our taxes in our own county, but did our trading and went to high school in the other county and got our mail from its county seat because that town was much closer than our own county seat town.